Good evening. Good evening, sir. Why is that? Okay, welcome you all for the today's uh, study session. We come basic concepts of goods and service tax. We are having a esteemed speaker along with us today, Sia Kalyan Kumar sir. Now I request Sia Ravindra Kore, the chairman of Sikasa, to escort sir on the dais. And welcome you to the floor. Okay. Explain the concepts rather than going into the 
you know, the model GSK law that has come out. To give you a brief background, uh, we have uh, multiple indirect taxes as on today. If you start with central levies, we have uh, service tax on provision of services, central excise on manufacture of goods, customs on import export of goods, CST on interstate sale of goods. Coming to state levies, you have value added tax, you have entry tax, you have uh, octroi, you have entertainment, you have cess, what not. All these taxes, you know, had actually uh, at a global platform reflected India and in not so ease of doing business. Once the new government came in, or, the, or even the earlier governments, you know, they wanted to study how their taxes are in India and what are the changes that should be brought out to facilitate the ease of doing business. So the idea uh, to to think around GST started almost 13 years ago, uh, where the earlier governments decided to look into the existing internet tax system and see how they can improvise on it to, to bring India into a global platform and also for the domestic industry to ensure that there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, inefficient, to remove any inefficiencies in the taxes. So there are several committees that were set up uh, to understand the global uh, value added tax systems across the other countries. Uh, there were uh, committees that were set up. So they come out with a study uh, <coughs> uh, which captured three different models of uh, GST or VAT you know, uh, in, in the other countries. So one is a central uh, uh, GST or union you know, GST you know, which is levied by the central government or uh, you know, the federal government. And there is a state levy, a state GST where you know, the respective state governments would levy in those countries. And there was a dual GST, where both center and the state would levy or would have concurrent powers to levy taxes. And given the federal system that we have, and to retain the sovereignty of the states, you know, that exist as on today, the committee recommended a dual GST, which is equivalent or, uh, you know, you can say, it's a, it's a model that has been, uh, you know, I would not call it copy, but influence from the Canadian model, which follow a dual GST. So in India, we are going to implement uh, a dual GST, where you would have a levy from a state government at the state level. At the same time, on the same aspect, you would have a levy from a union government. Now, why did we require a GST? You know, we have been uh, you know, uh, uh, accustomed to different levies. Uh, over the last 40 to 50 years, the Excise Act has been 1944, Sales Tax 1956, uh, you know, uh, Service Tax 1994. Why did we actually require a complete revamp of the existing indirect tax systems? What was the need? <coughs> the study suggested that you know uh, there was a lot of cascading effect that was happening in the indirect taxes. I'll give an example. If I'm a trader in, uh, you know, say, uh, say uh, mobile phones. I am a dealer in Karnataka in Bangalore. I am selling mobile phones. Mobile phone is goods and goods is subjected to local value or VAT value added tax if it is called locally. And if it is interstate, you have a CST levy. So the premises from where you are actually carrying out that business is subjected to a service tax uh, you know, under the category of renting of a mobile property. So as a dealer, you had an input tax of service tax on the renting of the premises. <coughs> on the output, you have a VAT on the sale of mobile phones. The current legislatures does not provide you a cross credit. The service tax credit that you that you have on the renting that you are paid to the landlord, which is renting of the mobile property, that could not be adjusted to the VAT that is that you are charging to a customer on sale of mobile phones. So what was the effect? When you are pricing the product to the customer, given that it is not a creditable cost, given that the service tax which you are paid was not creditable, you had to include that as part of your cost of part of your costing. So if you are selling the product at say hundred, that hundred would have or you know, it would have covered a component of service.
reverse tax, say 15 rupees, assuming for a number, 15 rupees is embedded into the cost of 100, and 100 when you are selling it to the customer, you charge, you know, bad on it. Say, given that mobile is an information technology product, it's taxed at 5.5%. If the dealer had got the credit of the service tax on the renting of the property, he would have brought down the cost of the mobile phone, you know, to an extent where he would have got the benefit, to the extent of the benefit that he got of the credit. Say of, from 100, he would have brought down to say 90 or 95 rupees. That is the exact restriction that we have as on today. You take the other situation. If I am a service provider, if I am providing taxable uh, services and if I am purchasing certain goods to to be used in the provision or it's, it's for the provision of those services currently the service tax uh, legislation or the segment rules mm -hmm. did not allow me to take the credit of the VAT that is paid on the goods so if I am a service provider and if I purchase say laptops I use that you know in, in providing the services and laptop is goods and it would be subjected to VAT and that VAT which I have paid on the laptops, I would not have, I currently I don't get the credit when I am actually charging service tax on my provisional service. So there is a restriction on the credit. At the same time, there is a cascading effect. In the sense, if I am a manufacturer, there is a levy of central excise on manufacturer goods. Say, uh, you know, say, we will take the same example, 100 rupees, and give it the transaction value. The transaction value for levy of excise would have been say 70 rupees. On 70 rupees, you are levying excise duty, which is an aspect of manufacture. Adding your markup, you are selling the product to a customer, say 100. You are charge, charging VAT on that 100. We take the same example, 5.5 and 100, 5, 5.5 rupees. If you see that 5.5 is on a component which is already subjected to central excise. In this example, it is 70 rupees. 70 rupees is already subjected to an excise duty of 12.5% and upon that you are charging a VAT which is 5.5% so there is a cascading effect you know you are charging on an aspect which is already subject to your duty and on the same aspect you are charging a different levy which is value or tax given that it is a sale of goods that is what is Know, going to be removed or it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, that inefficiency is going to be removed under the goods and services tax. You would not have different aspects under the goods and service tax. Like aspects I would mean an aspect of manufacture, an aspect of service provision, or an aspect of sale. There would be only one concept called aspect of supply. Under the GST, once it is implemented, it is a levy on supply, supply of goods, or services or both. That was a major reason you now why they thought you know to remove this cascading effect and also to facilitate uh, easy credit flow in the supply chain. They thought it would be appropriate to introduce goods and service tax, where it is going to be a unified taxation system in India. It's a one cons consolidated you know tax or indirect tax on one aspect which is supply and there are other uh, reasons you know why they thought would be learned for example you know uh, you have litigation around whether a certain service or certain goods is subjected to VAT or service tax you talk about works contract you talk about software you know there is always a certain component of dual levy that is being you know charged as on today that would be removed under the goods and services tax. So with that background, we will you know, go through the slides and I would I would be happy to take any questions. You know, uh, if you feel that there's certain question that you can ask, you can always you know feel free feel free to ask it. Uh, it would be better if it is interactive so that we can learn better. So this is what is a current in that tax structure in India. As I said, there are multiple levels of indirect tax, customs duty, additional customs duty, special addition duty, central excise, state service tax, state VAT, entry tax, opt everything. And there are three 
In this slide, we capture three major sectors, you can call them. Manufacturer, a trading owner or a tra trader and a service provider. If you see, the taxes in green are all creditable as of today. A manufacturer is allowed to take credit of additional customs duty, special additional duty, central excise, service tax, even that. But if you see the other columns, a trader is is currently, uh, you know, is in a disadvantaged position because most of the taxes that are levied in the supply chain, most of the indirect taxes levied in the supply chain are currently restricted for a trader. Of course, for all the three sectors, custom duty is outside the you know, power of the GST, so custom duty continues to be levied um, even after the GST is implemented. So to remove this, to remove this disparity, the government is introducing goods and service tax where each of this sector would be at the same platform. Tomorrow if I am a manufacturer or a service provider or a trader, I would enjoy seamless credit unlike today where there are certain restrictions which this slide capture. Tomorrow most of these credits for a trader would become green. Similarly for a service provider, there are certain the restrictions like SAD is a restriction, uh, restricted credit today, uh, CST is an US credit restricted, VAT is a restricted credit. And as of today, CST is a non-creditable tax for any sector, manufacturer or trader. Service. Tomorrow, any interstate supply of goods or services would be subjected to IGST, which we are going to cover later, which is going to be creditable. So in the costing, you know, if we take the same example, one is you are you are removing one. So what we discussed is the one tax, you know, which we are going to enjoy under the uh, you know, uh, GST. But in the supply chain, if there are multiple, you know, uh, uh, supply chain uh, dealers, then at each stage, if there was a cost at each level. Then you would have had, or currently you are having a cumulative, you know, cost effect in the supply chain. That is going to be removed under the GST. So we, we discussed only one to one level, one leg of transaction, A to B. But if it was a, A to B, B to C, C to C to D, if at every level there is a restriction of cost, as on today, and because of which there is a cost that is embedded in the ultimate price to the customer, tomorrow at each service supply chain, you are going to enjoy those benefits. So instead of 100 getting reduced to 90, you may actually see getting reduced to 60. Because the multiple supply chain dealers in that, you, know, you may, they may want to pass on that benefit to the ultimate customer. So it would have a cumulative positive benefit under the GST with respect to the costing. That is what you would see under the GST. But it would take some time, it would not be, uh, you know, you cannot Visualize when the date is going to be implemented, it will have to pass through some time, maybe one or two years and then you will start enjoying the benefit of you know, the free flow of credit in terms of costing. And there are other factors which we are going to cover uh, subsequently. Any questions till now? As I said, I am keeping this to the minimum you know, basic concept level. If you have any doubts, you can, you know, Feel free to ask. I am not going into the litigation, I will just keep it to the minimum. See, as on today, uh, the draft GST or draft model, GST model law is out. You know, the government has come out with uh, the draft model law, which provides a basic framework of the GST, how the GST is going to be you know, once it is implemented. It is not the actual law, it is a draft model law which has been released for suggestions, recommendations, comments from the trade or bodies or from the dealers, associates, who, who would, or you know, uh, Chartered Opponents Association, you know, uh, where they can make recommendations on any suggestions uh, on the draft model of the release. So that is uh, being collated at uh, the government level and uh, whatever suggestions that are being uh, flown to them will be considered and the final uh, draft law is going to be released somewhere around November. Uh, the discussions are that you know the final draft law is going to be tabled in the you know winter session of the parliament, 
which is likely to take place around November end or December first week. The, this time, uh, the government is proposing to advance the winter session of parliament from a December to maybe a November last week or a December first week. So, few months. Uh, so, the draft model has come out only in June, but the discussions around how the GST has to be has been in public domain for the last few years. There are a lot of, as I said, a lot of committees that were set up to discuss what should be the best possible architecture of goods and services tax, considering the complexities in which we we do business in India. Uh, there were a lot of deliberations, discussions, a lot of uh, suggestions that were invited to see, you know, what should be the best possible, um, you know, GST architecture. This, these three components are the the framework, you know, on which the goods and services tax is going to be laid. The first is, as I said, is a single taxable event, which is supply. Tomorrow, GST is going to be supply. What is supply? We'll cover in subsequent slides. It is not a tax on manufacture, it is not a tax on provision of service, it is not a tax on sale of goods. It is a tax on supply of goods and services. What is supply? We will cover later. The second major change or the basic framework. From an origin based tax, we are moving to a destination based tax. I will take the same example. I am a dealer in Bangalore selling mobiles. If I am selling to a customer or another dealer in say Maharashtra, I am collecting the tax on the invoice, okay. I am remitting to the government of Karnataka, filing the VAT hundred returns in Karnataka. And the tax that is being remitted to the government uh, uh, will go to the Karnataka mm -hmm. government because it is an origin based tax. Origin is the goods from where it has been, uh, the moment has commenced. So in this case, it is Karnataka, so the revenue would go to the Karnataka. Tomorrow, the GST concept is a destination-based consumption tax. The appropriate state to get the revenue is the state where the goods or services ultimately gets consumed. In the same example, the goods have moved from Karnataka to Maharashtra. The appropriate state where the goods are consumed, or you can call it a place of supply, you know, which we are going to cover briefly later. Place of supply is where it is ultimately delivered, which is Maharashtra. So today, instead of remitting the tax, you know, today we are remitting tax to Karnataka. Tomorrow, under GST, I have to remit the same tax to the credit of the Maharashtra government. How do we do that? We cover when we cover the returns or payment of taxes. So that's a major shift. I will have to tomorrow, when it is implemented, decide where, which is the appropriate state, where is the you know, place of supply that has happened. And it is easy for goods to, you know, identify and locate. But what about services? I cannot feel, touch, see, visualize. How do I determine, track, you know, where the goods, services have been consumed? If there are, you know, multiple offices where services are being uh, you know, crisscrossed, it's going to be challenging practically to identify where exactly the goods are consumed. And what about the valuation of those uh, services? So these are the practical challenges that we will have to, you know, uh, await clarification from the government. As I said, this is only a draft model law, which would mean a one side of a coin. We have to wait for the rules to come out, which could clear the majority of the doubts, and then subsequently, once the GST council is set up, we could hear on exemptions, uh, you know, the rates of taxes. Uh, you know, all those things which would be more or less uh, clear at that point in time. So what we are going to discuss is only based on the draft model law or the other material that is available in the public domain. The third major shift. Today on the invoice, if I am a trader, I would charge a VAT component if it is a local sale, and otherwise it is a CST if, it, if the goods are sold in the state. And if I am a manufacturer, once I'm, when I am clearing the goods from the manufacturing, I would charge excise duty and if it is sold, then I would charge VAT or CST. If I am providing a service, I would charge service tax on the invoice. Tomorrow, <coughs> given that it is a levy on supply, there would be two components of taxes on the invoice if it is a local supply of goods or services. On every invoice, you would see a SGST component and a CGST component. 
whether it is service or goods, every invoice under GST, you will have two components of tax or two lines of tax. One is a is GST component, the tax credit will go to the respective state governments and then there is a CGST component which will go to the center. Tomorrow if the rate is decided say for example 20%, so we have we are seeing a debate around what should be the appropriate rate uh, of tax. Uh, even if you take uh, the rate recommended by the chief economic advisor, say 18%, it's going to be 8 CGST, uh, 9 CGST and uh, 9 uh, SGST on invoice. And if the same goods is sold interstate, you will have one line item called IGST, Integrated Goods and Services Tax. Whether it is uh, interstate sale of goods or integrated supply of goods or interstate um, you know, uh, supply of services. So these are the three major changes that you would see under the GST. Any questions or doubt, you know? I use that GST at that. In which a weekly step, a weekly step, that state GST or interstate central GST or intrastate GST, the integrated GST. I am confused about these also. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Here is weekly step. One step is like this. If I sell goods to Karnataka to Maharashtra, then central central GST will come. And if it sell within Karnataka, then GST will come. Then when when will the integrated GST will be come? Okay. So I don't know the source of your information, but if you are selling the goods from Karnataka to Maharashtra, there will be one single component of tax that will be levied, which is IGST. IGST component is a combination of the rate of CGST and the SGST that is you know worked on the back end but the IGST itself will be the one single line item you know on the invoice the discussions around that is you know there could be one common rate across India for all the states IGST could be common but we will have to await clarity uh, on this rate but whatever rate that is prescribed there will be one line item on the invoice which is IGST and IGST in this case will be will go to the credit of the Maharashtra government so when you are filing the or paying the taxes you, you, on, on the Chalan you identify the appropriate state to be Maharashtra and goes to the credit of the Maharashtra the CGST and SGST component on line items you will, you will find in every local transactions every intrastate transactions whether it is goods or services, you will have these two line items. But if the moment it is interstate, you will see only one line item. Any other questions?
some of the major or the common taxes that we come across on a day to day basis. Um, so there are 17 indirect taxes which are going to be uh, subsumed under the GSC. The popular or you know the most common central levies are central excess duty, the CVD, the SCD, the service tax, everything is going to be subsumed and it will also cover the CST here. Coming to sales levies, it's the value added tax, every state by tax is getting, getting subsumed. Entry tax, uh, not only of FTRI, probably you know the doctor which is in Bombay you know, may continue, there's, there's some uh, you know, legislative uh, what I would call hindrance uh, in the way it has been uh, amended, the constitution has been amended, we will not get into that. Um, so the entry tax is going to be subsumed, the luxury tax is going to be subsumed, all the states, cess and surcharge is going to be subsumed. So in total there are 70. So what you would have is only the CGST, SGST and you would have the integrated goods and services tax. What happens to uh, the duty on import of goods? Currently you have uh, how many components of uh, duties on customs? What are the th three different components of customs duty? So you have basic customs duty, you have contravailing duty which is CVD and you have special regimen duty. Now if CVD is in lieu of excise which is now getting subsumed and SAD is in lieu of sales tax which is also getting subsumed, what would happen to the import duty? or the, the customs duty when you import the goods. So do you have you are you left with only PC or you would have done some different tax? Any thoughts? You agree that there are three components of duty as on today. And C V D is is in lieu of excise, SLD is in lieu of VAT, and these two are getting subsumed. You will have GST. So when you import goods, say after the GST is implemented, what should be the taxes or are you left with only BCD tax, BCD duty? So you will have BCD plus an IGST on it. There is a separate act called the Integrated Goods and Service Tax and under the Integrated Goods and Service Tax, interstate supplies have been defined and interstate supplies have been defined to cover import of goods also and services. So when you import goods or services uh, of both under the GST, you will have the basic customs duty, then you will have the IGST. What would happen to STPS? What would happen to uh, SEZs? See, as of now, there is no clarity uh, in the draft model law. What would be the fate of STPI units or SEZ units? We await clarity on that. But the way uh, the other legislations are being amended, say for example, custom amended to remove certain provisions applicable to SCPI, looks like the government may want to remove the benefits for an STP and a GST, uh, and would be you know taxable. So if, if any goods are being imported by an STPI tomorrow and a GST, it could be subjected to tax. As on today, you have the exemption of customs duty certain uh, the condition that the goods are bonded, all those requirements are there. So tomorrow you may, you may see that you know the STPIs may not enjoy the benefits, but we'll have to have clarity on that. Uh, SCZ, currently you have uh, either a refund mechanism or it is zero rated. In Karnataka it is a refund mechanism and SCZ also enjoys excise duty exemption and custom duty exemption. Tomorrow they may all be uh, may not be exempted, they may go into a refund mechanism. So, a supplier making supplies to SCZ may have to charge and SCZ may have to file an application to get a refund. 
so it won't be an upfront exemption or the there is a possibility that you know they would make it zero rated. So if it is zero rated in the supply chain, the supplier can still enjoy the credit. Any thoughts? Any questions? Sir, professional tax will be rated. Professional tax will continue. <coughs> Levy of tax. We talked about this. If it is intrastate supply, which is supply within the state, you will have two components CGST and SGST. If it is interstate supply, then it is IGST. Sir, what we want to talk about the GST, you know, it will affect only on direct taxes and direct taxes, not any other like ESI, PF, PT. It will not to the in that area, right? It would not have an impact on direct taxes, it's only the indirect taxes which is going to happen. Okay. All the taxes which we have covered here are all indirect taxes which are going to be subsumed. All other taxes which are not indirect taxes will continue. There would not be any change into that. Because GST is an indirect tax and all these indirect taxes are going to be subsumed. See what exception that they have covered is only octroid. Local municipal taxes also may get subsumed. Only octroid is somewhere kept out, but entry tax, municipal taxes, which they get subsumed under GST. As we discussed, the levy is on supply. So I will not get into complete details, but I will cover uh, the broad concepts on supply. Supply has been defined under the drop model law. Supply has been defined with an inclusive definition. Inclusive it starts with the word supply includes. It is it is not a uh, you know. Uh, Restricted definition, it's an exhaustive definition. Restricted definition would mean it starts with supply means. If it is exhaustive, it starts with includes. So here, mm -hmm. the supply has been defined to start with includes, so which would mean this is all indicative list. It could be uh, more than this also. <coughs> so they have covered, supply could cover sale, transfer, barter, exchange, license, rental, lease, disposal, concentration and it has to be in furtherance of business. So all these aspects, sale, transfer, lease, there has to be a consideration. At the same time, it has to be in furtherance of business. Furtherance of business would mean there has to be a commercial motive behind doing all these things. Sale, as we know, it's transfer of property in groups. Transfer. Transfer could cover stock transfers. Today, Company having multiple branches and making a stock transfer of goods, it is not subject to a VAT or CST against the statutory form. So, if, if it is in the state, it is exempted against the statutory form form F. However, if you have a reversal of uh, input tax credit um, as per the state right provision. But tomorrow, stock transfer would be subjected to tax. Of course, you will enjoy the free flow of credit. Barter, exchange of goods for goods or exchange of goods for services, or it could be vice versa. Barter is, is a very new concept that has come in <coughs> because barter historically, if you go back to sales tax uh, uh, cases, barter has always been uh, kept out of the levy of VAT. There have been a lot of decisions around, you know, that should not be because 
there is no consideration. Consideration has to be linked to money or money equivalent. And barter is an exchange of goods for goods. So long as the exchange, the goods which are being exchanged, there is no value attached to it, and you are getting something in return, that would become a barter. Exchange means when you attach a value to a product or a service that is being exchanged, it becomes part of your exchange. Otherwise, barter would be an exchange of goods for goods when there is no value attached. But the problem or the practical challenge that would uh, come around barter is how do you value this? Because if I am doing a barter, say, to a person, the consideration for the product that I am exchanging is a product that he is giving to me. And similarly, it is a barter for him also. The practical challenge is, you know, who is liable to pay tax on barter or whether it would be a, you know, dual, I mean, two separate transactions and where each one would try and uh, tax it and what would be the valuation to that. So these are the answers that we would be looking at, probably the rules, the notifications that would be issued once the GST Council uh, is set up, that would give a lot of clarity. Rentals, lease, disposal, everything is covered. So it's wide, wide variety of every thing that we do on a day to day basis is getting covered under GSP. However, as I said, the GSP council will be set up. They would recommend to state governments and central governments to exclude certain class of goods or to exclude certain class of dealers either from registration or from payment of tax uh, and which could cover any of these aspects. So we will have to wait for that clarity. Importation of services, whether or not for consideration. So as an, as an individual, tomorrow if I import certain services from outside the country, I may be subjected to uh, GST. And it doesn't, um, you know, uh, extend to say that it has to be in furtherance of business. So even if I don't have a commercial motive, I may end up uh, paying uh, GST on importation. However, there is a separate section, section 9, which talks about registration. There is a provision to, to exempt certain class of persons up to a particular limit, uh, you know, if you are importing the services for personal use. So we may see certain uh, notifications coming where they would uh, prescribe a value up to which your importation of services for personal consumption could be exempted. And then it also goes on to add with supply as specified in the Schedule 1 and 2. Schedule 1 and 2 covers gamut of transactions. Something, some of them historically have never been taxed. And you could see them coming under the tax net under GSC. And Schedule 1 covers a situation, even if any of these transactions are carried out without any consideration, they would be subjected to GSC. And of course, there are valuation rules that are prescribed where they would determine what should be the value for all these services or all these transactions that would be carried out. If you take one by one, permanent disposal of business assets, transfer of disposal of business assets. Business assets have not been defined under the modern law. Business assets could cover your fixed assets, your stock in trade, your furniture, office furniture, it could be anything. It's not been defined. So tomorrow, if you are permanently disposing of any of these, you know, the GST would be applicable. But again, the practical challenge would be given that everything is a self-assessment, you know, the, the indirect taxes. Now, how do you keep a log of all these transactions? How do you determine the valuation for this? And what, are, and what would be the power of the officer to reassess the value for all these transactions is something that we have to wait for. Temporary application of business assets to a private or a non-business use. If a managing director is given a car, office car, and if he uses the car to drop his children to school, it would get covered to the, you know, in this clause. Temporary application of business assets. So temporarily I am using the motor car to a private or non-business use. So I am dropping my 
Imagine that you're dropping kids to the school. To what extent you would tax and on what value would you tax? You can see the practical challenge coming in. You may have used for one year, one hour, half an hour, but what is the value? Services put to a private or non-business use. I'm a child government practicing. I help my friend to file his income tax return. I don't charge, I do uh, it uh, you know, because of the relationship, I do it. Services, so I am in the service of providing child accounting services. I put that for a private or a non-business use. So the help that I am making to a friend to file his return, as is for a non-business or a private use, and that would be subjected to GST tomorrow. Assets retained after deregistration. Any company which retained the assets after day registration would be subjected to uh, GST. But then, if you link to the existing system, you would not get a cancellation of the registration unless the taxes applicable on that assets are actually discharged. But once you claim a registration, then it becomes a taxable aspect in the GST, something that we have to see how it would work. Supply of goods, services by a taxable to another or non taxable person in the course of furtherance of business. I think this is where you have samples, you could have a stock transfers also getting covered, you could have donations getting covered here. By a taxable person to non taxable in furtherance of business. So anything could get covered here. So unless the government comes out with specific clarity on what is the scope of all these clauses, it is left to individual interpretation and department could you know, extend their power to tax anything and everything under any of these clauses. However, there is an exception that is given if you are supplying to a job worker, it is exempted, however there are certain conditions linked to it. You need to get an order from the commissioner and you could cover the chain of uh, job workers in the process and you should clearly mention what are the different types of goods that are going to do a job worker, how much time it would take and when it would come back. So there are certain conditions that are prescribed, then you would enjoy that exemption. Otherwise, it would become taxable and job worker uh, is specifically covered under uh, services. So it will be treated job worker. Work is going to be covered as services under the GST. Any questions till now? Is it becoming too technical? I want to. I can skip few to take you through some basic concepts if that is the case. Sorry. Rejections. What rejections? How is it? Uh, uh, Treated now, as on today? That we can take reverse of credit. We'll reverse the taxes to the order. So when you say rejection, do you mean that sale is concluded and then the goods have come back? Yes, sir. But if my understanding is the goods are rejected, say for example, I as a supplier sell the goods to a company, there is a inward division in the company where they would inspect, do a quality check. If the goods do not meet the quality check, goods get rejected. The sale is not concluded at all. Unless the contract clearly says that the moment I dispatch the goods, the sale is concluded, then yes, you know, we can agree to this point. But the, if the sale is not concluded until it is accepted, the transfer property has not happened until the goods are taken into the factory and agreed, then sale is not concluded. In that case, there is no question of paying tax and then taking the reversal. And in certain cases, what will happen, like practical cases, that the whatever quality team they have accepted the goods are. Once it go on sitting on machinery. If it is accepted, then the sale is concluded. Then if the goods have come back for whatever reason, then it will be reversal. And currently if you link that, states have six months time limit to take a reversal. And certain states have limit only to only reversal of, uh, uh, only for sales return. But if there are other reasons also few states allow. But in this case, if the goods are coming back within the time limit, you should get the reverse. Any other questions?
Okay, to keep it simple, I will go to straight to taxable person. <coughs> As I said, it's a destination based consumption tax. So, if I am making an interstate sale from Bangalore to Mumbai, the appropriate state to get the credit of tax is Maharashtra. Now, if it is a destination based consumption tax, do I, do I have to, or the supplier has to take the registration, or the buyer has to take the registration? Both have to take the registration. So, both have to take in Karnataka or in Maharashtra? I see consensus in this. I am not sure what is the source of this. Most of you all have the same view, which may not be right. Because you have to take a registration. Okay, before that, taxable person is a person who supplies taxable value of goods or services beyond the prescribed term of limit. So currently it has been prescribed at 10 lakhs, but last few days we have been hearing uh, you know, the revenue secretary has they have discussed with the trade bodies they may cap to 25 lakhs. But the draft model law says. If it is beyond 9 lakhs aggregate turnover, then you have to take a registration and you have to start paying tax if it crosses 10 lakhs. So, what is aggregate turnover of goods or services? 10 lakhs. Sorry? 10 lakhs. 10 lakhs of what? Yeah. Correct. So, 10 lakhs of what is that you are talking about? Turnover. So, aggregate turnover has been defined to cover all your taxable supplies, which covers goods and services, exempted supplies, non taxable services, mm. supplies, exports. So, if in a year, cumulatively you cross 9 lakhs threshold, you have to take a registration. Now, aggregate turnover is it limited to state or multiple states? The way it has been defined is if an entity has say 5 locations all over India under the same PAN, X limited, having the same PAN, multiple offices, then this aggregate turnover would be uh, turnover of all these 5 offices. So, if cumulatively all these 5 offices supply taxable, exempted, non-taxable or export of goods or services, cumulating beyond 9 lakhs, then you have to take a registration. And where do you take? You have to take a registration in the state from where you make the supply of that goods and services. So, in this example, if I am making a supply from Karnataka to Maharashtra, the appropriate state to take a registration is Karnataka. The destination based consumption tax is only limited to the extent of the appropriate state which would have the or which would enjoy the tax because of the consumption. But the registration is on the supplier. I register, I file the return, I identify that Maharashtra is the appropriate state. In the back end, the credit would go to the Maharashtra government. The central government will act as a nodal agency. It will pick the tax from Karnataka, it will credit to the Maharashtra government. It will not go to the city of Karnataka. But you are obligated to register in Karnataka and file the returns. We take the same example. Five states I am operating. Four states I have taxable supplies. Fifth state I have only exempted supplies. But the exempted supply is considered to consider for the aggregate turnover to determine whether you cross the threshold limit. But do you have to take a registration if you are making exclusive exempt services, exempt supplies from that state? The answer is no. You need not take a registration from that state. However, that turnover would be considered as part of your aggregate turnover to determine which of the states, you know, whether you are crossing the threshold limit and which is the appropriate state where you need to take a registration. Clear? Exempted state is only to take. Thank you.
It's a self-assessment. It's everything is dependent on you. You need to. So tomorrow the state government realizes it. Tomorrow it realizes that you don't have a registration. Even today, they have the power to ask for information. Now, why didn't you take a registration? Why should I not ask you to get registered here? That question, that power always exists even today. So tomorrow, if you have not got registered, but you have an office there, obviously they can visit and inquire. You know, why are you not taking registration? But for Karnataka, if you are crossing, or if you are making, say, one lakh taxable value of supply, and cumulatively among all the five offices, you are exceeding nine lakhs turnover. Then from Karnataka you have to register, you have to get that registered here. Okay? If if I am making a taxable supply only from Karnataka, I register only from Karnataka. All other four other states, I will consider only the turnover, if they are rendering only exempt supply, I will consider that for my aggregate turnover purpose, but I will not register because there is an exclusion given. I will register only from the state from where there is a taxable supply happening. Say in the four states there is a 50,000, 50,000, 50,000 and 50,000. But in Karnataka, so you will take three states 50, 50, 50 and Karnataka has one lakh. But Tamil Nadu has say 10 lakhs of uh, non-taxable services. Cumulatively, 10 plus 1.5, 11 and half plus 1, 12 and half. So you are exceeding the aggregate turnover of 9 lakhs. And you have to register in all the four states because you are providing a taxable supply of 1 lakh, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000. But you need not get registered in Tamil Nadu even if you exceed 10 lakhs because you are providing exclusive exempt supplies. But your entire exempt supplies are now all over India under the same plan will be determinant you know, for you know, aggregate or not. So no more outside. One person can take two within one state? Within the state, are you saying whether there is an option to take two registration? Yeah. Yes, you can. If you have a say, Bangalore has, uh, if the company has two uh, different uh, business units, one in Bangalore, one in say Hooghly, you have an option to take a registration, uh, one in Bangalore, the other one in Hubli also. So the registration under GST is a 15 digit number. So the first two digit is a state code. In Karnataka the state code is 29, <coughs> followed by the PAN number, 10 digit PAN number. Then you have the unit reference. In this example there are two units under the same PAN. The Bangalore unit will be given one, the Hubli division will be given two. So you will have that reference and then so 2 plus 10, 12, 13, 14 is only for you know uh, future future reference and 15 is a check visit. So that's how it's it's now been divine, devised. So any number of uh, registration up to 29 if I'm not wrong you can take registration within the state under the same pack. So that 13th digit, 13th digit has a facility to record up to 29 numbers. So if you have 29 units in Karnataka, you can register this. Any other question? So since we take the registration this time, right? So manufacturing in state will do that, right? So how can they be commented? So this was one of the points that was picked up by the opposition, and especially the manufacturing states, the Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, and some other states where they have uh, uh, attracted a lot of investors and they have given a lot of industrial exemption from a state industrial policy point of view. Uh, exemptions or exemptions or benefits like uh, reduced land value, electricity exemption, uh, entry tax exemption. So the various exemptions that they have given and few have excise exemption like Himachal Pradesh now have excise exemptions. North Eastern states have excise exemptions, which has been that. All these are now would become producing states and given the destination base, everything is going to go out of the state. And that was the exact reason why majority of the you know, state governments opposed. And then 
the consensus has been reached that the central government is going to compensate all such states where they are going to incur loss for the next five years, 100% loss. So in the earlier constitution bill, which was cleared by the Lok Sabha in, in May 2015, had staggered the compensation mechanism, first two years, 100%, and you know, there was a slab rate, which the opposition did not agree, or the states did not agree. And then it was tabled before Rajya Sabha, they amended it, and they said that, you know, they want, or they agreed to get 100% compensated, only then they supported the bill. And that's how it went. So any loss that would happen um, under the GST, it gets compensated by uh, the central government. The main reason for that was uh, the CST is getting abolished, which was an origin-based tax. So all the CST, though it's at a central levy, it was always with the state governments. It was never shared with the central government or it was never it never went to the central government. It was always the state government. And that one, one two percent or whatever CST that is uh, getting abolished, the state governments would lose. And that is one of the reasons you know why thought that they should get compensated. Entry tax will get subsumed. You will not have entry tax, you know, uh, under GST. That doesn't mean that the check post would go away. Uh, to my mind, you know, check post would continue for the reason that you know it is a destination-based tax. So the government may want, may want to track how much goods have got into the state. At least for the reference purpose, they may want to track. But there is a possibility of uh, you know, immediate facilitation, you know, quick facilitation in the check post. You may face a lot of hindrance as on today with the check post offices. Tomorrow, it may become everything electronic. The moment you reach the check post, you just swipe your number, uh, you know, the, uh, the PAN number, then registration number, then you can just walk in. There will be quick or easy facilitation in the check post, but the check post itself may not go away. Coming to Octroy, uh, Octroy may continue in Bombay. We'll have to wait for clarity because the way the constitution has been amended, you know, looks like you know the Octroy has been kept away, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Um, uh, that's for the constitution experts. You know, I was uh, discussing with one of the constitution experts. That's what he has expressed this view. Um, so we'll have to wait for clarity, but otherwise it should get subsumed under uh, the GST. And uh, when the bill was tabled in the Raj Sabha, in fact, many majority of the MPs from uh, Bombay have expressed these uh, you know, concerns before the House, and uh, many of them wanted a compensation structure to be discussed with the state governments and want the municipal corporations to actually. Uh, you know, have a clarity on how it's going to be compensated, even that offer is going to be abolished. But we'll have to see it from a, a technical point of view whether, by amending constitution, whether they have made some, uh, you know, whether there are some changes uh, which they have missed out, something that we have to wait. Uh, any other questions? So there's a certain exception that has been prescribed. If you're not crossing the threshold limit of 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs, so 5 lakhs is for the, in fact it is 4 lakhs, 4 lakhs and 9 lakhs, uh, you need not register. So 4 lakhs is for uh, the northeastern states and also for the Sikkim. So if you're not crossing the threshold limit of uh, 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, then you need not uh, get registered. And agriculture, you not get registered. An employee providing services to an employee in the course of his employment, he not get registered. But currently, we, we are facing issues or, you know, uh, there's a levy or the department is going after companies where there are certain services which are rendered by the employer to the employees. Some any recovery that is happening from the employees, the department 
uh, you know, has issued show cause notices proposing to tax us. Say, for example, you know, uh, a meal coupon is given to the employees by the employer when you join. And that is generally given, say, it extends for one month. And he exhausts, say, within 10 days, whatever meal, uh, voucher, whatever is given. And subsequently, he resigns on 15th. So the meal watcher is, is valid in one month, but he consumes in 10th by 10th, and by 15th he resigns. Given that meal watcher or as per his compensation structure, he will enjoy only up to 10th, whatever additional that he has consumed for the 20 days, it would be recovered back from the employee as part of his final compensation. So when you are recurring back, would that become part of your service, taxable value of service, something to, so this is only one, one example, there are other examples where they want to treat this to be a provision of service and they want to report tax, uh, there is no clarity that has come out, everyone is, uh, is challenging that position and it's under litigation. So you may see a similar thing happening under GST unless they come out with some clarity, only what is exempted is one way where the employee provides service to the employer and not the other way around. The litigation may continue. And the other one, as I said, if you are providing exclusive exempt supplies from that particular state, you may not get registered. And the last one, as I said, you know, there could be a cap up to which you are exempted from getting registered. If you are you know, receiving services, this would be, you know, uh, recommended by the GST Council and the state or central governments will come up with notifications describing the exemptions. <coughs> then you have a composition scheme. You exceed the turnover limit of 10 lakhs or 5 lakhs, but up to 50 lakhs you have an option to get registered as a composition dealer. Composition scheme, uh, to my mind, is currently exists only under the state grant legislations. It doesn't, uh, you know, except for few services in service tax, uh, they will be charged on the, you know, at the normal rate. But the concept, what they have borrowed here, is purely looks like from the state legislations, because the condition that is being prescribed to opt for composition is very restricted. You cannot have interstate supply of goods or services if you want to opt for composition. You can go in for composition if your turnover limit aggregate value of supplies of all your offices across India is up to 50 lakhs and if you don't make any interstate supply of goods or services, you have an option to go for a composition scheme in that state. Very important register. If you link this to a service provider, you know, if I have an office, uh, you know, a service provider having 10 offices across India, chartered accountant having multiple offices across India, and you would have, uh, you know, uh, interstate services uh, which would be provided. So I would be barred from, you know, opting for composition. But another hindrance is, you know, you cannot charge tax and you, can, you cannot claim credit also. So as a composition dealer, you would be outside the supply chain, you, know, you would be outside the, the credit you know, the supply chain that you would enjoy as a normal dealer. So if you want to enjoy the credits, then it would be better for you to you know, go in for a normal dealer and in the supply chain you pass on the credit. Tomorrow if I am a service provider, if I want to purchase uh, something from a composition, I will have to think twice because I cannot take credit. I cannot charge first of all and I cannot take credit also. So my supply chain gets broken. So I would be uh, I would be discouraging you know my company to purchase from a composition dealer and I would want to go with a normal dealer. But there is a scheme that has been prescribed that the rate of tax cannot be lower than 1% so it could be anything above 1%, 2%, 3%, 3%. So you have an option to you know, go for composition. Any questions? Sir, uh, what would be the impact on small businessmen? Small businessmen, yes, it would. Uh, uh, you're talking from a scheme point of view or generally under GST? See, uh, 
if you take uh, the three sectors, <coughs> manufacturer, you have an option to claim SSI exemption up to 1.5 crores as on today. But a service provider have to get registered once you cross 9 lakhs and then pay tax for up to 10 lakhs. And that also is on a similar threshold limit, 10 lakhs, except in Delhi, I think it's 20 lakhs. Otherwise, most of the states have either 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs as their threshold limit to get registered. Now, coming to uh, GST, the threshold limit that has been prescribed is 10 lakhs under the Mutraf model law. But as I said, you know, there will be deliberation, they may want to cap it up to 25 lakhs, 20 to 25 lakhs. So, anyone up to 20, 25 lakhs or whatever, assuming it is 10 lakhs for now under the law, that is, those are exempted. Otherwise, everyone has to get registered. So, all those small manufacturers, you know, I would call it job workers or small time manufacturers, may get impacted because up to 1.25 crores they had an, you know, they enjoyed the exemption and all of a sudden the threshold has come down to 10 lakhs. So everyone has to now get registered. So the discomfort would be majorly for manufacturers as compared to service providers or a trader who are anyways in the, you know, uh, the registration scheme. Just your question. What, what about the traders? Like uh, currently, yeah, they are people uh, who get goods without tax also. This is a current scenario. You get goods from the market, uh, not having a tax levy on that. And they push it on to the customer directly. But uh, there is a saying that in GST, everything has to be under the bill. So, so even now uh, you have that uh, requirement, it's a choice what the customer would make. Otherwise as a trader, if you are crossing, if I, if I have to link you to Karnataka VAT, if you are issuing uh, uh, an invoice beyond I think 100 rupees, you have to issue an invoice. If you are making a sale of goods, you have to issue an invoice and given that you are anyways registered, you have to charge tax on it, unless it is exempted. Whether you want to get a you know, to purchase something out of the books is something that's a choice that you would make. Otherwise, you have that risk, uh, uh, requirement to issue invoices and charge tax on it. And tomorrow, under GST, if you are crossing the threshold limit, you have to get registered. If not, you have a voluntary, voluntary option also. Even now, under the VAT legislation, you have a voluntary, <coughs> voluntary option you know, to get registered. If you want to enjoy the credits in the supply chain, and you don't want to break the supply chain, it would always be better to enter the credit pool, you know, get registered as a normal dealer, even if it is below the threshold limit, and then pass on the credit.
That is what is called as time of supply. So when is a taxable event occurs? Like in manufacture, the taxable event is upon manufacture. When do you discharge? When do you remove the goods? Similar to uh, GST, you have concepts like time of supply of goods and services, time of or place of supply of goods and services. Why, why is this important? Because that will determine when is the levy actually triggered. When do you have to, you know, when is the charge happen on the supply? And again, they have come out with various <coughs> events. And the earlier of these events would be treated as the time of supply of goods. So there are different provisions for time of supply of goods and different provisions for time of supply of services. Though the levy is only GST, the aspect of levy on goods and services would remain under uh, GST. So tomorrow if you are supplying any taxable value of goods, you will have GST of CGST, SGST on goods and if you are providing only services, you will have CGST and SGST of services. Then it becomes important when is the time of supply of goods and when is the time of supply of services. So there have been provisions that have been prescribed as of now, more of academic. How many of you know uh, point of taxation rules in the service tax? So you've gone through the rules earlier of the any of the three events. The similar provisions have been incorporated. At least for service, it's almost exactly the same replica. Uh, so earlier of the events, you know, you will have the taxable uh, time of supply. For goods, these are the events. Earlier of these events, then it is a time of supply. When the goods are required to be removed, then there is the date on which the goods are actually removed. So there is no concept called transfer of title to the goods. I will give an example. Say mobile phone. I go to a shop, I purchase the mobile. I will pay him, but I say I will not collect it. You keep it and come and collect. Has the sale happened? Ah, he would have done everything. You say I will not take the position or carry with me. You keep it, I will come and take it afterwards sometime. This is it. The reason being. Title, transfer of title to the goods has already happened. The risk and rewards with respect to the goods. If, if the goods is lost in its custody, of course commercially you may even agree to recover. But the title with respect to the goods has already been transferred. I may not have taken the question. Question doesn't become important in a sale of goods. Once the risk and rewards is transferred, then it is a sale. But in supply, the concept of transfer title to the goods would, would not be of much importance. What you need to determine is when is the time of supply happened and these are the events that you need to consider. It's more of like, you know, uh, you have to capture all this, you know, you have to check uh, for every transaction, has this happened? No. Has this happened? No. Has this happened? Yes. And that becomes. And for certain events covered here, some of them we can relate and, you know, uh, understand something which could be very unique to certain industries like you know accounting date on which the recipient shows the receipt of goods in his books of accounts if that happens much before any of the earlier events then that becomes a time of supply let's take an example i am a seller or supplier the customer is buying goods from me Practically, how would I know when he would have recorded in his books? I can understand invoice that is under my control. I can understand the payment. Because I am the person who is responsible to discharge tax as a supplier. I can have the reference of invoice. I can have the advance payment. If I make any advance payment, I have the control and you know visualization to that extent. But the last point, books of account, when would I know or how do I track or how do I come to know 
when that person would have recorded as uh, uh, as a sale in his books or a purchase in his books, and that that results in a, in a practical challenge. And he would have recorded, and as per these events, it is already a sale. I would not have come to know. I would have recorded on based on some other event, invoice or payment or whatever. So these are some things that we will have to wait for clarity. Uh, what is the reason or intention behind these provisions and or what exactly is, is the scope of coverage. Otherwise, as I said, it is left to individuals' uh, you know, interpretation. Um, as we progress, probably by the end of this year, once the GST Council is set, once the final legislations are you know, out in the public domain, we will have more clarity. And from once it is passed, uh, in the parliament, we will have the rules coming out and the GST council you know, slowly issuing you know, clarifications around certain aspects. So we will have more information to come to a reasonable conclusion on what exactly these are going to be covered, these are going to you know, encompass. Right? Any questions? So if there is silver trade for GST, silver trade? Like that. Okay. Like why? Is there any silver trade for GST? I didn't get your question. Silver trade for GST means? Means yeah, hundred thousand. Like for ten years. That's the basic fundamental framework on which GST is being introduced. You are going to enjoy the free flow, seamless credit. Whether you are a trader, as a manufacturer, today I am a trader. As I said, I am restricted to take the credit of service. Tomorrow, the same service I receive, I will have a supply invoice with CGST, CSGST on the invoice. I will enjoy the credit because there is no barriers now to uh, not to avail credit. Of course, there is certain restriction which we will cover later. But yes, the idea is to ensure that there is a free flow of credit, seamless credit. Service provider can take credit of VAT, VAT, your dealer can take credit of service plus, excise duty can be taken credit. Of course, there is no concept of excise, but it's the CGST or SGST that you are going to enjoy the credit. So, there will be only one day? So, uh, as I said, uh, the government had appointed a uh, chief economic advisor you know, to determine, to deliberate what should be the revenue neutral rate under GST. Uh, what is revenue neutral rate? If the government is enjoying certain revenue as on today, with, this, with the ex condition that exists today, given the framework under which the GST is going to be introduced, and if the state governments were to retain the same component of revenue under GST, given the framework or the background under which it is being introduced, what should be the appropriate rate to retain the same revenue? If I am getting 100 today, I should get 100 tomorrow. But my taxing aspect has changed. My origin base to destination has changed. There is a dual levy. So considering all these changes that are being introduced, if I have to retain this 100 rupees, what should be the appropriate rate that I should charge? What is the tax that you pay as on today on goods? Let's take one small example. Uh, anything. Non-IT products, what is the tax that you pay? 14.9%. Is that the only tax that you pay on goods? What is the component of indirect tax that you pay on a product that you purchase today? Is it only VAT? So what is the rate that you would, that the product already is, you know, sorry? Only 14.5? How 27? Sir, excise duty 12.5 on a manufactured goods and 14.5 percent. Maximum tax rate of this state plus uh, basic excise duty. Basic? Excise duty. Right. Big round of applause for him. Yes. It's almost right. I would not say it's completely right. There's an entry tax also which you missed out. 
and it may not be 27, so it could be around 27, 28, but if you see the excise valuation, we will take the same example, 100 rupees, if I am selling the product, I would charge say 14 and a half, 100, but my transaction value on which I am levying excise is not 100, which could be 70 rupees. So on 70, if I am charging 12 and a half, okay, if I have to equal that to 100, the effective rate could be 8 rupees. 8 plus 14 and a half would come to 22 and a half. Plus the entry tax of 1 or 2 percent, say 2 percent. 2 percent entry tax is on the entire 100 rupees. So 2 percent, 23 and a half plus, so it should be around 24, 25 percent. But blindly to take 12 and a half, 14 and a half plus 2 percent, it comes to 27, 28 percent. But otherwise, we are actually incurring a tax cost of around 22 to 25 percent as on today on every product. And when this committee was set up, headed by the chief economic advisor, he come, came out with four band of rates. Like how you have for the sales tax as on today in Canada, VAT, you have zero rate, you have 5.5 percent, you have uh, 14 and a half, and then you have uh, uh, you know. 2% for the energy sector. He has come up with a similar band of rates. He said 2 to 6 percent for essential commodities, 12 percent as a standard rate, which you can equate to 5.5 percent. Then there is a sin rate, like on uh, aerated waters, aerated villages, um, luxury cars, everything is adjusted rate of 40 percent. And then a revenue neutral rate of around 17.9 percent, which we can equate to 14 and a half to that. So these are the four slab rates that he has recommended, and that's where the debate happened in, in the Rajya Sabha. The opposition wanted the rate to be capped in the Constitution Amendment Bill to the extent of 18 percent. And they said, this is the reference that we are carrying. Your own committee member who is appointed by you has recommended 18 percent. We want to stand by it and we want to include that in the Constitution Amendment Bill. But the challenge what the government thought was, tomorrow for some unforeseen circumstances, if it were to increase the rate, it had to go through the, again, the similar process of amending the Constitution, which we have already seen has been a very tedious and cumbersome process. So to avoid that, probably the government thought it may not be appropriate to capture it in the Constitution Amendment Bill, but it was agreed to cap it in the model law that is going to come out. And if there is any change that is required from the model law, you could get that clear to a simple majority in the parliament, which should not be a difficult task for the government. And that was the whole idea why they did not cap. And this was one of the condition of the opposition. If you, if someone has closely followed the debate or the discussions as the bill went through Rajya Sabha. This was one of the key points that the opposition wanted. It had, they wanted this to be capped under the Constitution Amendment Bill, which ultimately did not take place. And they would, we could see that happening in the model GST law, and there could be discussions around that. So the answer to this is, the rate is not finalized as of now. It is the domain of the GST Council. GST Council, so just to give you a progress update, on August 3rd, the Rajya Sabha passed the Constitution Amendment Bill. On 4th August, the Revenue Secretary came out with a road road map. There's a last slide which I'll show you. So he said that almost uh, 350 officers are being trained. So once it it is passed uh, through the Rajya Sabha. 50% of the states have to ratify the Constitution Amendment Bill. As we speak, it has already crossed 16 states. 16 states have already ratified the bill in their assemblies. Now the bill can go any moment to the President for assent. Once the President assents the bill, then within 60 days from the assent, the government has to set up a GST Council. What is this GST Council? If I would just simply relate to the existing body, it is the CBEC or the CBEDD body. 
which is more or less like the heart of the GST. That is going to be the strong uh, uh, functionality of the GST, where everything will be rooted through GST Council. And what is this GST Council? GST Council is a composition of the Union Minister, Union Minister of State, Revenue Secretary, and all the State Finance Ministers. So these are going to be the members of the GST Council who are going to deliberate, discuss, come out with a recommendation with respect to aspects like what should be the rate of tax. So they will discuss, so they have taken this recommendation from the Chief Economic Advisor. They will again deliberate, in fact the discussions are parallelly going on. And they would decide on the GST Council and they would, the Council can make only a recommendation. So that would recommend to the states and to the central government that these are the band of rates that you could consider with respect to the goods. And they, they may also give a list of goods up to which you, know, you can charge so and so rates. So that recommendation can either be accepted or not, it is left to the state government. But they cannot reject the, the state governments, do not have power to reject that. So they will have to go within the framework or the, you know, the boundaries suggested by the GST Council. So it is going to be very powerful uh, uh, authority under the GST. So they are going to decide on the rates, they are going to decide on the, the law, the GST law. They are going to decide on the exemptions, you know, who has to be given, who are the classes of dealers who, are, who need to enjoy exemption or the class of products or services which would uh, have an exemption under the GST. So all these things are going to be the prerogative or the scope of the GST Council. So basically it's the same as whatever is happening now, it's just that uh, instead of uh, so many uh, other indirect taxes substituted by one GST. It, no, I would not agree because uh, today if I'm buying a product in Canada, it is maybe taxed at 5 or 5.5%. 5 .5%. In Tamil Nadu, it may be 12 and a half percent, not 40 and a half, whatever the residual rate. So, a, a customer or a dealer in Karnataka may want to buy it from Karnataka instead of buying it in Tamil Nadu, which is taxable at uh, you know, 40 and a half or the residual rate. And if he is a manufacturer, he is okay to have the heat of 2 percent because he can issue a form C and then buy from the Karnataka. Tomorrow, if the rate is 5 percent here and 5 percent in Tamil Nadu, then there is no difference. It is going to be the same platform, right? That is where, you know, one tax, it is one India and one tax. You don't, I mean, the idea on which GST has been floated is that it will be a one platform and it will going to be one, one tax, one GST. The trade disparities, the boundaries, ge geographical, uh, divisions would go away or should go away, that is how it has been thought of or contemplated. But given the political system in India, we will have to see whether it would actually materialize into the way it has been conceptualized. So, currently the jewelers are taxed at 1% and uh, they get the input credit also. Uh, what would be the situation on that? <coughs> and one of the reasons why they wanted to introduce GST is for this reason. Currently, you have a lot of exemptions, a lot of reduced taxation that is being levied on certain class of goods or class of products or class of dealers. GST is going to ex you know, cut down on those ex exemptions and expand the taxation base. Everyone is going to come into the tax plan. You will have very limited exemptions. And everyone will, will, will get the same platform. Today, you are talking about 1%. There are people who are uh, currently exempted. Tomorrow, they may become taxable. They may have to get registered. They may have to comply with other requirements. But the idea is, everyone, you know, it has to be a unified platform for everyone. And there will be very limited exemptions. Very, very limited. And that's going to, as we progress, that's going to simplify. And currently, we have that barrier, you know, I'm enjoying only 1% tax, 2%. And suddenly, I'm going to have a tax rate of either 12% or a revenue rate of, say, 18% or 20%. And 
And obviously, you will have that discomfort. But once you enjoy the, the credits in the supply chain, you know, as we discussed, you know, the, 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 in the supply chain, the dealers were to pass on the you know current cost as of now, as of now, which is a cost. If they were to pass on, then you will enjoy the benefit. Today you are paying a two percent tax with so many restrictions. The more the effective tax could be lower than that. You never know. It may not be, but but you will enjoy the free flow of credit and you will be part of the major supply chain. Credit won't be restricted and would not be a burden on you, you know, because of the restriction. Uh, you have to go for like SGST for state and CGST for one more bench in terms of assessment sir. As we are facing now for VAT we go for CTD commercial tax department. For other uh, excise and service tax we will go for CBI. What are your thoughts on that? It's better to be a single bench sir. Okay. That's an ideal situation. But if if you recollect the discussion that we had, there is going to be a CGST and an SGST, which would mean the tax credit would go to separate departments. If the tax credits are going to different departments, then they may want to reassess whether you are paying correctly or not. The power always rests with the state government or central government. So if you are a dealer registered, if you are filing, though it is a single return that you are going to file, the retail return is going to be shared between the state officers and the central officers. There is a possibility that you may have to run behind two different departments under the GST. But there is again, you know, a suggestion being made. Uh, recently, what we hear is any dealer or any SSC up to a 1.5 turnover limit may have to exclusively or it could be exclusively administered by the state departments. So anyone, say, if you are in the provision of service, say up to 1 crore, you may have to go to the state departments and not to the central department. But anything beyond 1 crores, you may have that you know, a requirement to you know, go to two, two separate departments. But as I read in the social media yesterday's on, on September 1st uh, briefing by the Revenue Secretary, the summary indicated that you know dealers may not go, have to go to two separate departments, but we'll have to await clarity. It's not it may not be an official announcement, but we'll have to await clarity on that, uh, how they're going to devise that. But otherwise, the way it is being uh, you know formulated, it looks like we may have to go to two separate departments beyond a particular time term or limit. In this case, it could be 1.5 crores. After that, every dealer having 1.5 crores may have to go to two separate departments. But we'll have to wait for clarity on that. Because under this, every all most of the services will be covered for taxes. Initially, as a company, I have to pay. Sir, any moment is subject to tax credit. Initially, I lose my capital. It leads to block of capital loss. Until unless I get refunds or whatever it may be in time. Initially, until unless it utilizes GST, it leads to block of capital loss. Sir, basically. You're talking about post implementation. Yes, sir. Then you would enjoy the credit. But sir, if I receive a refund for whatever it may be in time, the I refund can... under the GST is limited to only two situations. One, where you have an inverted duty structure, which would mean you would have paid excess tax on your inputs as compared to your final product. So if your inputs were subjected to say the highest rate of 14.5, if you have to just take an example, and if your output is subjected to only 5.5%, you are Ending up with an inverted duty structure, in that situation you have an option to file a refund application. The second is where your output is exported out of India. All your input supplies, the taxes that you are paid on input supplies would be eligible as, you know, of course they are eligible as credit and you can file an application for, uh, file for refund of those taxes. So only in these two situations that the you know, model GST law is recommended. But you know, if you see the process document that has been released by the government uh, last year, it covers various situations. But we'll have to see you know, how it's going to be done in the final uh, law. But the draft model law currently restricts only two situations. 
Sir, it is not tedious for one transaction there is two authorities who is monitoring. And if uh, for example uh, central have any litigation on one transaction, then state also have the same litigation. Maybe a different opinion for that. Then who will finalize that? Those Sorry. type of litigation. And we can't for one transaction we can't have a different opinion between state and central. So that clarity is awaited. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, this is a concern for majority of them. You know, tomorrow I may have to start interacting with two departments, and they may have a you know different views. And that's exactly the, you know the GST Council is going to address. Given that GST Council is a is a, a team of all state finance ministers, okay, and the central government, you know, union finance ministers. All these problems are going to be deliberated there. Now, these are all practical problems. So they will come out with some resolution to say that you know how it is going to be addressed. You may have a tribunal to go for an appeal, or you may have a Supreme Court level directly to file an appeal against this dispute. Is something that is going to come out with a dispute resolution. No, if I got to a pass notice from both central and state, then. As I said, you know the revenue. If you go by the media reports, what revenue secretary said. Somewhere indicated that you know you may not have to go to two separate departments, so which would mean that they may come out with some clarity around that. But what I was saying is, from a law point of view, the way it is being worded, to, have to file a return and you go to two separate departments, given that you will have both CGST and SGST, they may more administer. You know, uh, both of them may administer. However, up to 1.5 crores, you may have the facility to go to one single department. Beyond that, you will have. To go to two separate departments, but we will have to see, you know, what is the clarity that we are going to make up. If you were to rely on whatever the media reports so are published, um, uh, based on what Revenue Secretary has said. Otherwise, as you said, you know, it is going to be a practical challenge, but we are anyways living with it, you know. On the same aspect, I am getting a notice from my department, I am getting a notice from the service test department. Today, I am anyways addressing the same issue. I am anyways interacting with two departments. Tomorrow it's going to be merged, and then you know you will have CGST and within one umbrella. That's only change. Otherwise, I'm interacting with both departments. In fact, I'm interacting with central also. No, currently, if I say, um, for example, excise have any issues uh, for any transaction, uh, we have litigation on central excise. Then they give the show cause notice. Then that department may not know for the same transaction. They will not raise any right. issues. So that exactly is the uh, issue which the GST council will address. Given that on the same aspect both centre and state is going to levy tax and these disputes would definitely arise if the state government take a stand on certain position in which the central government may not agree. And tomorrow you have a resolution at state level but this, on the same issue the central government may come out with a notice challenging the same position. And that's why the GST council will come out with directions how these need, these would be addressed. These are definitely practical concerns, but this will be hopefully will be taken care by the GST council and come out with certain directions, saying that on these 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 classification issue only state government has a ultimate power, or up to five crore turnover only state government can issue notices. Anything beyond that will go to uh, you know uh, the, the appellate you know uh, the procedures. They may prescribe some methodology. Beyond 5 crores, it is only the state government which can, you know, uh, assess or investigate or whatever, you know, raise issues. So those kind of convenience they may bring up. Uh, given that, you know, they want to simplify the sanction system and ensure that the ease of doing business, they may not, you know, want to bring in uh, that kind of culture and the system. Petroleum is uh, what do you think? Is it going to be part of GST or not? Separate means? Separate means? What about alcohol? For human consumption? No, I didn't get what you mean by separate. <laughs> Alcohol for human consumption is completely out of the purview of GST. 
what do you mean by all of those provisions? The constitution has amended the provisions to levy or give power to both central and state government to levy tax on goods and services excluding alcohol for human consumption. That means GST can never levy tax on alcohol unless and again the constitution is amended to exclude this. So which would mean the state government will continue to levy tax on alcohol. Whereas petroleum is within the purview of the GST. If you read the Constitution Amendment 246A, there shall be levy tax of goods and services on provision of supply of goods and services excluding uh, alcohol for human consumption. It has not excluded anything else. So petroleum will be part. However, they have amended the state, uh, you know, state list to say that at least for few years it will be zero rated or you know it won't be taxed. Uh, so that would that decision would be taken by the GST Council. So it is within the GST, GST purview, but it would not be tax subjected to GST as of now. Whether it would be zero rated, whether it would be exempted, or whether there would be a refund mechanism, something we have to wait clarity. But there would not be GST on the petrol products. So which would mean all is the inputs will be subjected to GST, but the output will be subjected to your state excise or whatever. So that is where all these companies would end up with having a huge cost. Because the government has to come out with some kind of uh, resolution and that. But as of now, it would be kept uh, without any GST tax on it, at least for two years. And then GST council will again review the situation and at that point in time, they may want to withdraw that exemption and bring the petroleum you know, into the GST net. But alcohol for sure is, is out of the purview of the GST. Unless again the constitution is amended to exclude that exception. Example, 
I'm a person, uh, I'm a dealer in say Andhra Pradesh, I'm a jeweler, Janus. I come to an exhibition here, I display my jewelry, I make sales, customers, I, I sell it to the customers, I wind up and go back. So the jewelry that you are selling here, these are actually taxable supplies. And there is a value attached to it and they are subjected to CGST, SGST. And given that place of supply is within the same state, then it is a uh, interstate supply and it is subject to tax. So in that situation, there is a provision to get a registered as a casual trader, which you have in Karnataka back also, and then discharge the tax. <coughs> non resident taxable persons, any persons who have been identified to discharge tax in a reverse charge, whether it is for recipient of service or recipient of goods, uh, the notification will, uh, will identify those persons who have to pay in the reverse charge. All those persons will have to get registered. We have a similar concept in service tax also. Input service distributor. Who is an input service distributor? Office, reverse charge, Sorry? Reverse charge is an input service distributor. I'll take an example. I have a manufacturing unit where I manufacture goods. I take a registration of XIs. But I have a corporate office or a sales office somewhere within the city limits. Okay? But my XI registration is in some industrial area beyond bandwidth limits. And I have an XI registration there. The corporate office or sales office that I have within the city limits, that would be subject to a certain tax because the premise is, is a renting of remote property, there is a service tax. There is a security guard to that office where service tax is charged. There is a man for supply, the cleaning staff who are deputed where I you know, procure, that is subjected to service tax. Courier service, I may have paid from that office, that is subject to service tax. All these are, you know, hit the head office or the, you know, the sales office. But my manufacturing unit is somewhere else where there is an exercise and my corporate office is not registered. In that case, you have an option to take as an input service distributor. You take a registration of the principal office as an input service distributor. You transfer all the credits to your manufacturing unit and the manufacturing unit take, can take the credit of that. A similar concept has been introduced in the system. Then electronic commerce operators, aggregators, Aggregators generally to cover Ola and Uber. Electronic commerce operator, aggregator, you know, uh, you have a service provider in the form of a driver. You have a service recipient in the form of a customer. But the Ola facilitates to enjoy this transportation facility. So they have been made responsible to get registered. If you are providing such service, then Uber, Ola are getting covered in the back, they have to get registered. Electronic commerce operator, I am an Amazon, I log in and I purchase a Lenovo laptop. He has to get registered as an economic commerce operator. It's currently limited to technology products, but to get registered and discharge tax. How will he pay the tax on Amazon? Just, just uh, with me, buyer and seller, that's it. Correct. So there is a concept called TDS that has been introduced where on the, the full value we have to deduct certain percentage and then give it to the government. That has been brought out in the draft model which there is a been recommendation to do away with that but we will have to see how it is going to be. Okay. Registration we talked about. Payment of GST, any payment Beyond 10,000 rupees, you have to discharge electronically. So you have NEFT, you know, RTGS facilities, cash, credit card, debit card facility to pay taxes, uh, any form or mode of taxes that you can pay. Uh, and you have a facility, special counters, even in notified banks where you can go and, you know, pay the taxes through those counters. Uh, everything has been prescribed. And this is what I was talking about on the distribution of credit. Though we are talking about seamless flow of credit, there is again a barricade that has been introduced. I cannot, so if I have say 
two locations, Karnataka and uh, Tamil Nadu. I have a CGST credit, CGST credit, right? And I also have a CGST, SGST credit. I cannot utilize, first I cannot utilize the prospect. SGST, SGST is not possible. SGST and CGST are also not possible and vice versa. However, you can enjoy the other credits like IGST liability first you need to set off against your IGST credit in the same sequence you know, you have then it is CGST and then SGST. And if you have a CGST liability first you are just against your CGST credit then IGST credit. Similarly, we have state GST credit or liability first pay are just the SGST credit and then you are just the IGST. Which would mean that every dealer, if he is operating at a multi multi location you know, uh, over across India, he will have to maintain all these credit pools at a state level. You have three input credits and you have three output credits. Six into number of states, ten states, sixty accounts that you have to maintain. It's going to be a huge challenge for all those people who are operating in multi state. And which would also mean you need to tweak your IT systems also. Currently, it may not facilitate capturing all these data points. So, tomorrow at the GST, you may have to tweak and ensure that you know all these facilities are incorporated in your ERP systems, IT systems. It's a huge work. Though we are talking about seamless credit, you again have these restrictions. I think we will. Okay. Yeah. Any, <coughs> have any questions? We be happy to take. <laughs> what, you, what is your view?
And once the GST is implemented, there will be cars everywhere. And the prices will shoot up, at least for some time. That's the expectation. And then once everybody starts understanding and analyzing the benefits that are there under GST, it would start flowing in that supply chain. And given the mass of India and the complexity of the transactions that are being taken place, you will start reaping benefits only after one and a half, two years. And the government want to capitalize on it before they go into elections before 2019. And that's why they want to bring in GST as early as possible because as they uh, step into the elections uh, more in 2019, they will actually be to start enjoying the benefit of GST. And it may add, uh, you know, positive favors in, you know, to the government. I'll take you to the last slide. Okay. This is one snapshot. Of, sorry. GST is not only a tax change. It is a complete business reform. You will have a fiscal impact in terms of taxes, what we discussed on goods and services. The goods rate coming down to 18% the service tax. You know, service rate increasing to uh, 18%. You will have a cash flow impact. Today, stock transfers are not getting transferred, uh, taxed. Tomorrow, you will have uh, stock transfers subjected to GST. So, to that extent, your cash flow gets impacted. Product pricing. Today, I am selling at 100 rupees. I have factored the services cost, which is a cost to me when I have sold it to the customer. Tomorrow, once I enjoy the benefit, I may want to pass it on. So, that will impact my product pricing. Instead of 100, I may want to bring it down to 90 rupees. Supply chain. Today you are having 10 locations across India and you are stock transferring and you are delivering to the customer. Given that it is going to have an additional burden on your cash flow, you may want to directly ship it to the customer. So you may want to tweak your supply chain itself instead of stock transferring it to multiple state locations and then start selling it from that location to customers. Given it is an additional cost and logistic cost, and additional logistic cost, you may want to cut down and say, I want to let me send, sell it directly from the uh, main warehouse. So, tomorrow you can see number of warehouses coming down across all over India. You may have location, region wise located, you know, warehouses, maybe north one, south one, east and west, instead of having 20 uh, you know, warehouses across all over India. So, this is a uh, GST is going to impact on supply chain. Your IT systems, as I said, three input credits, three output credits, output taxes. Into number of states, you may have to tweak your ID systems, ERP systems, and ERP systems, if someone is using SAP and Oracle, they may have a hard tough time because most of them are standardized. They may have to tweak it before it is implemented from April 1st, 2017. Accounting. Today I may not be accounting the VAT credit that I enjoy uh, because it is cost. I may not show it as a separate line item in my books at all. Tomorrow I have to show it because I may enjoy the credit and I have to revamp my accounting system itself, the way I account the transactions. Similarly, it would have an impact on business process. If I have followed certain protocols, given the existing indirect system, I may want to revisit and see how I can change those business process to enjoy the benefits of GST. So it's not only a tax chain, it's a complete business reform. And all these aspects need to be looked into as we progress towards implementing GST. With that, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you for enlightening us with the various concepts of GST. I request Ms. Divya to give token of appreciation for our sir.